people of Monkey Barrel. Let me hear you make some noise. Please welcome to the stage, Sam Lake. For me, really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. I'm recording my special. This is exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Can you just give me a cheer if you have seen me or this show before? Okay. So you guys are going to have to do something fun that we in the biz call pretending. <laughs> like you haven't seen all of this before. Um, but thank you very much. Um, uh, a couple things to get out of the way. Uh, first of all, um, who here is familiar with the works of acclaimed musical artist Miley Cyrus? <laughs> Good. Um, it's just that a lot of people say I'm a lot like her. <laughs> do you because of the fact that we both love wrecking balls, I'm gay. <laughs> okay, mostly okay with that, good. I like a few homophobes in, but not everybody, okay? We need a balance, don't we? I just have to let people know that so that they know that this could be called a gay show, okay? Because it, 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 some people, it's just unsettling for them. Like, you, say you've got like a muffin, right? And it could just be a plain muffin and people go like, oh, I love muffins. But then you introduce like a blueberry muffin. It's the same as the regular muffin. It's just got blueberries in it. And then someone goes, oh, why can't it just be like a normal muffin like all the other muffins? Why does it have to have blueberries in it? You, I've always said they don't have as many rights as other muffins. <laughs> so, good. Okay, I think we're all on board with that. Lovely. Uh, second thing, um, who here is having a little drink? <laughs> Lovely. Okay, you might notice over here, I've also treated myself to a little drink, a little treat for the show. Because uh, I'm not like one of those laddie communities who comes on stage, you know, with like a pint, you know, like a pint of like beer or lager or meth or whatever it is that you straight <laughs> straight people drink. I didn't check. Do we have any straight people in? Oh, okay. You're not too proud of it. Good. No, that's perfect. <laughs> Don't wait. I'm not going to suddenly start bashing straight people. I actually love you guys. I'm obsessed with your culture. Um, <laughs> Honestly, FIFA, mm, love it, absolutely love it. Has drama, mystery, intrigue, it's like an episode of Desperate Housewives or something. I really enjoy it, okay? So, I treat myself, when I do this show, to a little glass of rosé, okay? Much more on brand for me, okay? But I can't just start necking it now like I'd want to because we've got a whole hour to get through. So, what I do at all of my shows is I designate someone the role of rosé administrator, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, sir, I think I'm going to come to you if that's all right. It's, you've got very fun glasses, so it's your own fault for having an attractive face, OK? <laughs> um, wh what's your name? Liam. Liam. Everyone say hi to Liam. Hi, Liam. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Don't talk to them, just you and me, OK? <laughs> all right? This is Daddy's show, Follow the Rules. <laughs> Um, Liam, tell me about yourself. What do you do? You work in IT. You work in IT. Thrilling. Lovely. Love that. <laughs> IT, you crazy bitch. Um, <laughs> lovely. And who is this with you tonight? This is Anne, my partner. Anne, your partner. Hello, Anne, your partner. Um, everyone say hi to Anne. Hi, Anne. Is Liam a trustworthy person? He is. Good. OK. Are you comfortable with the role of Rosé Administrator? Right, I'll explain to you what you need to do. At some point in the show, when we're all having a nice good giggle, jiggle and wiggle, you are going to signal to me that I can start drinking the rosé, but there's a specific way I'd like you to do that, OK? Are you familiar with the TV show The Teletubbies? <laughs> Yes, OK. So, you know in the Teletubbies, right, there's that bit where they go inside their little hill house because that guy on the klaxon goes, Time for Tubby Custard. Time for Tubby Custard. <laughs> <laughs> there's just a sudden look of regret on his face now. <laughs> when you think it's OK for me to start drinking the rosé, I would like you to say, Time for Daddy's Rosé. Time for Daddy's Rosé. Are you comfortable with that? Would you like eye contact, Jura? Oh, my God, yes, I would! <laughs> Quick question, has he ever asked you that? <laughs> 
I would love that. Do you want to do a little practice? What, what do I need to say again? Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Time for Daddy's Rosé, OK? Right, so let's all, on the count of three, I'll go one, two, three, we'll all laugh and then you say it, OK? One, two, three. <laughs> Oh, you really paused as well to make sure you really got your moment, didn't you, as well? <laughs> After that, like, really pantomime laugh that everyone did. What the hell was that? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> OK, it sounds like you've got the job uh, very well. Everyone give a massive round of applause to our Rosé administrator. <laughs> so, wonderful stuff. Now, final question for you all. Do we have any men in? Interesting. <laughs> I'll admit, I ask that question to a lot of audiences, and every time, all of the men look at each other and go, is this a trap? Because, um, <laughs> like, I get it, lads. Like, you don't want to be that one guy in the room who goes like, woo, I'm a man, oh my god, I bloody love being a man, it's so good being a man. You don't want to be that guy, do you? Especially not in today's societal climate. You don't want to be that guy, do you? Because, lads, let's just get real. It's hard being a man, isn't it? Very hard being a man. Oh, it's so hard being a man. Isn't it hard being a man? Oh, honestly, it seems like the whole world is angry at us all of the time just because of all that stuff we did and repeatedly keep doing. <laughs> I get it. You're obsessed with me. Um, <laughs> I don't really describe myself as a man, really. I sort of think of myself more as an adult boy, right? We know adult <laughs> boys, don't we? Um, but I did something recently that's made me realise I have truly come into manhood. That's not a euphemism. <laughs> what happened was um, I discovered my man noise, right? Big moment for me. Now, if you don't know what a man noise is, it's that noise that every man in your life will start making at some point in their life. It's the signal he's become a man. It's an involuntary noise. We don't mean to make them, and we make them at the same same time as doing a very mundane action. The best example of which is, picture a man sat down in a chair, he won't be able to get out of the chair without going <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> we know they do it, lads. We have to make that noise, don't we? It helps us fire up the quads, doesn't it? We have to make the noise to complete the action. There's another one that I'm a big fan of. Um, if you've ever been to a restaurant with this type of man, the server will bring the bill to the table at the end of the meal, and instead of saying something like, oh, how much was the meal? They'll say something like, oh, what's the damage then? Oh, what's the damage then? Oh, classic of the genre, that one. I absolutely love it. Now, I had gone for 31 years of my life. That's right, I'm 31. How do I do it, OK? Wow, no, just make no noise whatsoever there. <laughs> Normally, people, like, gasp or go, like, oh, my God, it's fine, you're not that kind of crowd, we'll move on. I had gone for 31 years of my life. Oh. OK. <laughs> Oh my god, why does this happen at every show I do? I don't... <laughs> honestly. No, I've gone all of that time without making a single man noise, always thinking, oh, when's it coming? When's the man noise dropping? OK, but don't worry, everybody. I've discovered my man noise now. Guess where I discovered it? Only in the bloody gym. Yes. Of course I discovered it in the gym. Look how hench I am, OK? Look how these very voluptuous pecs really stretch out the face of Gail Platt from Coronation Street nicely. <laughs> Let you in on a little secret. I wore this shirt every day during the run of the show at the Fringe. The shirt is the same size. I am not. Um, <laughs> I can make Gail talk, actually. Like, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Lovely. Sorry, it's not a titty show. Sorry. Anyway. So, I'm in the gym. I don't go to the gym that often. I'm not there all the time. I'm not particularly sporty or athletic. Um, the closest I've come to a sporting injury is when this Fitbit gave me a rash. Um, <laughs> So I just happened to be in the gym when it happened, right? And I'll tell you what I was doing. I was there in the gym working out, and I was doing some of these, OK? Bicep curls, OK? Yes, I do have lovely form. Thank you for noticing. Oh, hello! <laughs> I've got a show to do. Fuck me later. So... <laughs> Cracking out some bicep curls, all right. Now, I was just doing those. There's a man next to me, right, doing the exact same exercise. There's only two differences, right? He's much bigger, much more muscular, much hencher. And at the end of every rep of a bicep curl that he does, he's doing this. See if you can spot the difference. He's going, mm, mm. Sorry if I aroused anybody there. <laughs> 
He's grunting like nobody's business at the end of every rep. And I used to think men at the gym made those noises on purpose so that we'd all look at them, like, for attention, right? We'd all look at them and go, mm, they're lifting something very heavy over there. They must be so clever. But no. <laughs> no, that is their man noise. They have to make that noise in order to finish the exercise. And I knew this had to be true because there I was still doing my little bicep curls. And then out of nowhere, I was like, oh my God, these are getting a bit tough now. <gasps> I might have to let out a little man noise in order to get to the end of the set. Oh my God, it's finally happening. Here we go. <laughs> and it's the last rep of the set and it's really tough. I'm really having to push it. I'm really straining, okay? But in my head, I'm going, oh my God, Sam, here it comes. You're becoming a man. Oh, I can feel the man noise bubbling up. Here we go, really let it rip, really let it roar, Sam. And I get to the top of the rep, and then I just hear myself go, <laughs> Have you ever made that noise, Liam? Time for Daddy's Rose. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the best timing that bit has ever had, I have to say. <laughs> what a sexual man noise that was. Uncomfortably sexual. Nobody expected me to make that noise, including the man who'd been very politely working out next to me, who stopped what he was doing immediately and went, excuse me, mate, how many more sets of whatever this is? <laughs> Do you have left? And I sort of awkwardly went, I'm so sorry, sir. I didn't know I was going to... I didn't... I've got four more sets. I'm going to be here for quite some time. I'm so sorry, uh, sir. So sorry, sir. <laughs> and he went, don't worry, that's perfectly fine. But as he said that, he picked up all of his stuff from the floor and went to a completely different side of the gym so he didn't have to put up with me anymore. And I was, I was left stood there thinking to myself, wow, just through my natural behaviour, presence and actions, I have made someone feel so uncomfortable that they felt they had to vacate the area immediately. <laughs> and when I tell you I have never felt more like a man <laughs> in my entire life... <laughs> I get it, lads. Let's be toxic. It feels amazing. <laughs> oh, what a time. What a time. Um, and I've been on like a bit of a, a journey with sort of like my masculinity, my manliness, because, you know, because I'm 31, right, and I'm also gay, right? I'm not going to stand up here and be like, oh my God, 31, it's such a scary age to be. I can't believe I'm in my 30s. It's not that at all. It's just that 31 is a perfectly normal age to be in human years, but in gay years, <laughs> I've been legally dead for nine years, okay? <laughs> That's just how that works. The young gay men, they are absolutely savage, all right? And it's so hard to keep up with them, so hard to fit in with them, right? It, like, I do so many things to try and keep up with them, right? Like, aesthetic Aesthetically, okay, got a whole new look going on to the one I used to have. I mean, we've seen Gail, but also up here, made some changes. I got some cool trendy glasses, grew out a thick daddy tash, okay? But I think we can all agree it just looks like I bought my face in a joke shop, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? And I'm fine with that. The only problem it causes, you know when you're up in the club? You know when you're up in the club? You're having a lovely time in the club? If you're wearing kind of cool glasses, someone will come up to you and go, oh, your glasses are so cool. Can I try them on, please? I know they don't want to try on my glasses. They want to see if when I take them off, will my nose and moustache come <laughs> off with the glasses? They think I'm there in disguise. Uh, as one other thing I did, sort of fashion-wise, try and keep up with them. Uh, do we in this room know what a jock strap is? <laughs> Just a very subtle nod from the Rosé administrator. Love a the gays, they love a jock strap. They love a strappy pants, something fun to toot and scoot around in, OK? All right, we understand why. And I was always too scared to wear them. But then at one point, I was like, no, I'm going to be down with a I'm going to get a jock strap. I'm going to wear a jock strap. I'm going to look great in it. I tried it on in my bedroom and went, OK, my whole ass is out. My whole ass is out. My whole ass was out. Just so there for anyone to see, right? It was so felt very vulnerable and exposed. I ended up buying a second jock strap and wearing it back to front, so that way <laughs> you get full coverage, right? A little life hack for you there. There's really one thing, though, that sort of made me realise I am never going to fit in with the younger gay men. And this happened when I was in a gay bar. I had an interaction with a young gay man, right? He walks into this gay bar and he is wearing a sheer tank top, bright neon green culottes and is completely barefoot. It's a very strong look for any club you're going into, right? <laughs> 
And as he's walking into the club, he's walking across the dance floor, right? And just openly doing a little hit of poppers, just doing some drugs on the dance floor, doesn't care what anyone thinks about it, just having a good old sniff. He walks over to a man at the side of the dance floor, doesn't say anything to this man beforehand, just slaps him across the face like that, just gives him a swift backhander like that, walks off as if he's done nothing, climbs on top of the bar, steals a bottle of tequila, downs the whole thing, smashes the bottle on the bar, jumps off the bar, lands in a split, pops right back up, very impressive if I'm being honest, and then the security guard sees all of this, drags him outside to the smoking area where he starts smoking not a cigarette, not a vape, but a whole ass Cuban cigar <laughs> in the smoking area of the club. Would you ever see someone bust one of those things out. He did all of those things within five minutes of entering this club. And after doing all of those things completely unprovoked, all this man had to say for himself was, babes, I can't help it if my life is dramatic. <laughs> you can help it, actually. <laughs> Nobody made you do any of those things. What are you talking about? I sort of looked him up and down and went, <laughs> you might be the worst man I've ever met in my entire life. Um, how do I be exactly like you, please? Because <laughs> for a little bit, I was like, maybe he should be my role model. Maybe I should try to be like him so I fit in. But I was so different. Like, I mean, for starters, walking into the club doing poppers, just doing drugs in front of everybody. Absolutely not. Don't get me wrong. When I was his age, I would do drugs all of the time. I couldn't stop doing drugs. I do drugs every day. I couldn't get enough drugs. I do drugs all of the time. Couldn't stop doing drugs. I absolutely <laughs> love drugs. Why don't you believe me? <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, I've done drugs once, um, uh, and it was at a house party, okay, and get ready for this, okay. At this house party, I did a pill. <laughs> yeah, did a pill at a house party. Wow, he's edgy, isn't he? A pill at a house party, what is this, an episode of Skins? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Sorry, when I, by the way, when I say I did a pill, um, I, I didn't do like a whole pill, okay? I'm not crazy, you just do a whole pill. Um, I, I split a pill um, with 17 other people at the house party. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here has done 1 18th of, of MDMA before. It, it's sort of like having a very strong mint. Do you know what I mean? Like an airwaves, you're like, whoa, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Oh, well, that was fun whilst it lasted, okay, lovely. I've just never been the drug-taking type. It's just not my style. I mean, I do enjoy a puff every now and again. Anyone here like a puff? A little bit of a puff? Any puff heads in? Anyone like a bit of kush? A bit of the dank kush? Just one clap, okay? Just me and you. You like a bit of the dank kush? The danker, the better. The cushier, the better. Just give daddy a fat toke on that chunky green. <laughs> For those of you who don't talk streets, that's weed I'm talking about. <laughs> Every now and again, me and some friends will get together, have a little spliff or something. It's nice, it relaxes you, it calms you down. I will say, I am never the one who purchases the product, as it were, okay? You guys have known me for, what, all of 15 minutes. Do I seem like someone who could articulately navigate a drug deal situation? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, this has only happened to me once where I had to buy drugs. I had gone round to my friend's house because we'd set aside an evening to smoke a lovely fat doob, as the kids often do. And she goes, Sam, I'm so sorry. I've not had time to call my dealer. I've not got anything in. If you still want to have a spliff, I'll give you his number. You sort it out. You call him. And I said, don't worry about it, babes. I have got this. I went into this situation with the utmost confidence. I took the number. I put it in my phone and I said, hello, I would like one weed, please. <laughs> And he said, love that enthusiasm, not quite how this works. You have to tell me in grams, like in weight, how much you would like me to bring. And I said, OK, could you just give me one second? Thank you so much. And I put the phone down, because I'd never been in this situation before, so I didn't know the correct amount to ask for. So I did what I'm sure we all would do. I looked around the room that I was in. I tried to find an object that I thought was of similar shape and size <laughs> to a pile of weed. And for some reason, I decided that that object was a Cadbury's cream egg. <laughs> And I don't know if you've read the wrapper of a Cadbury's cream egg. They are 45 grams. It gets worse because before I pick up the phone, I go, hang on, I can eat three of those in one sitting. 
So I should get three for me, three for Karen, three for Greg. Greg might bring his girlfriend. Hello, could I have 645 grams of weed, please? Over half a kilo of weed ordered on my first drug deal. It's a business-to-business -business level transaction. It's breaking bad. Seriously, as a thank you for coming, stop me on your way out. I've got baggies for all of you. I'm still shifting it, OK? So Daddy stays away from the drugs. He has to, OK? I have to. I wasn't like this guy in the club personality-wise either. Like, he was all, oh, oh, he was very... If I had to describe his personality, I would say he would have been deemed slightly too toxic for your average episode of Come Dine With Me. Does that make sense? <laughs> we can place him with that, can't we? Because let's get real. The gays love them, but aren't we on a mission to infiltrate all of the beloved British reality TV programmes at the moment? It seems like we're on everything. Like, a couple years ago, we got gay people on Strictly, which is lovely. I think that's wonderful. Big win for us. Biggest win since we finally converted Schofield. But, like... <laughs> I won't say how we did it, but Holly has a lot to answer for, OK? <laughs> but seriously, Gays on Strictly is a bit of a confusing one for me, because do you think I've ever turned to another gay man in my life and gone, God, do you know the world that I feel the most persecuted in? Yes, it's definitely the world of competitive ballroom dance. <laughs> what a homophobic world we all know that to be. But I do like to see us on there. One show that we've never quite cracked, and this show is starting up again soon, so who knows, fingers crossed. That show is Love Island, OK? Every year, don't we, don't we? We ask for queer contestants on Love Island, and it never happens. They always say, oh, sorry, it's, it's boys and girls. It's always been that way. It'd be too complicated with the format. We couldn't find a way to make it work, OK? And I think that's such a lazy excuse, all right? So I have come up with a solution that I think works for everybody, right? A way for us to get queer people on Love Island, have a little queer love story play out on national TV. I am going to volunteer to be the first gay Love Island contestant. However, I don't want them to put any other gay people on the island with me. <laughs> OK? I just want it to be me and the straights. <laughs> and I'm only there to be a nasty little bitch. <laughs> OK? I am starting fights around the fire pit for absolutely no reason. I am throwing wine in men's faces, going, you know what you did. You did nothing. I'm just a little bit of a cunt, OK? <laughs> now, can't we all agree that's the kind of chaotic gay energy that I think 2023 so desperately craves already? And wouldn't it be nice to see that queer love story? But I don't know if that will happen. Um, and I actually can't enact that plan of mine anymore. And this is sort of what this show is all about, because about a year and a half ago, I got this. I got married. <laughs> Thank you very much. You hesitated before the applause. Don't think I didn't notice that, OK? <laughs> it's legal now. Deal with it. <laughs> I did. I got married. I got married to a lovely, handsome, kind young man. His name is David, and I'm OK with that. Um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with the name David. It's just that alphabetically on my phone, David always comes up next to Dad, which occasionally means somebody gets sent a message they should not have been sent. <laughs> And then you have to awkwardly follow up by going, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to send you that naked photo of myself, David. That was meant for my dad. <laughs> no follow-up questions, please. Um, um, and I, I, I'm going to try and tell you the story of how, like, David and I met, how we fell in love and how we ended up getting married. But I'm going to be honest with you, OK? It's quite a difficult story to tell, because this all happened over those few years where the event happened, the pandemic, right? So lots of things kept changing every time I tried to write this show. I mean, for example, like, I've got a bit of interesting news to share with you all now that I'm doing the show at this point. Um, I, I would like to announce to everyone here that David and I, my husband, um, we are about to welcome our first baby, um, PlayStation 5. <laughs> OK? Thank you, thank you. 
It was a very difficult birth, um, <laughs> but very rewarding now that I'm a mum, OK? Um, so very nice, all right? Lots of things change. One of the other things that changed is that I moved so that David and I could be together. I'm originally from Cornwall, right? Very different to where I live now here in Edinburgh. In Cornwall, right, I mean, like, I'm from a little minor village called Red Ruth, where we have the expression, you can take the boy out of Red Ruth, but that would violate his probation, right? <laughs> Like, it's not the nicest place to grow up. Like, the drug abuse rate there is very high. The homelessness rate there is very high. The incest rate there is very high. But it's not all good. There's some downsides <laughs> to living there as well. <laughs> I've been back to Cornwall in about, like, 10 years, and there's a good reason for that, right? And the last time I heard about what was happening in my hometown of Red Ruth um, was on BBC News. I read it in a BBC News article, most read article of the day, and the headline of the article was, Mystery Swimming Pool Shitter Strikes Again. <laughs> strikes again happens more than once. Someone kept pooing in all of the swimming pools, and it was gross. And I bet you didn't know this. If you're a police person and you see a crime for the first time, you get to name it for everyone else, right? So for some reason, the police in Cornwall decided to call this crime logging. <laughs> Horrid name, awful name for it. And because they never caught the guy who was doing it, everyone was calling this mystery man the logger, right? <laughs> Very strange, everyone calling him the logger. I'm the only one still calling him dad. Um, <laughs> That's why I sent him the nudes to cheer him up, you know. Um, <laughs> now, and also, like, not the easiest place to grow up being gay, OK? Right, like, it, like it, it, it was fine. I was surrounded by nice people in my family who accepted me. Like, I once asked my mum, like, out of interest, Mum, did you have any clues when I was little that I might grow up to be gay? She said, well, one Christmas, um, you asked for a handbag. You were five years old, and you asked for a handbag as, like, your main present. And I said, fair play, Mum. That's quite a gay thing for a five-year-old boy to do. And she went, oh, but that's not the clue. That's not the gayest thing you've ever done. I'm just warming up, son, actually. Actually, um, <laughs> the gayest thing you ever did uh, the following Christmas, you asked me for another handbag because apparently the first one I got you was too trashy. <laughs> um, I took one look at it six years old and went, <laughs> Is this white leather? Mother, I'm effeminate, not a whore. Can we. <laughs> Can we have some culture, please? culture is very hard to come by in Cornwall. So that's why I'm very glad that now I live here in Edinburgh and I love it here. I love all of Scotland, really. I think Scotland's a much more cultural place. You know, lots of famous artists come from Scotland. It's like you can, you can just walk down any street in Scotland. It's like you can feel the ghosts of people like Sir Walter Scott or Carol Smiley or Mrs <laughs> Doubtfire <laughs> or that one lady whose kids don't know how to flush the toilet after they've had a shit. <laughs> because it was fucking one of yous disgusting. Um, she is the mayor here, in case anyone didn't know, if anyone's from out of town. But I really like it here. Anyway, right, let me tell you the story of how David and I met, because I love telling people this story. People always want to hear how we met. It is a cute story, right? OK, so David and I met um, in this gay bar, right? And he walked in, and he was wearing a sheer tank top, bright neon green culottes. <laughs> Good, you're paying attention. <laughs> Lovely. Good crowd, good crowd. No, David and I met in a much more sensible way uh, on one of the apps, all right? We know the apps, OK? And it was very good. This, just to give you an idea of the competition David was up against when it came to courting my favour, it was David who I was talking to and then one other man who only sent me one message. Hello, I'm a local baker. Great, love to support local business. <laughs> I have easy access to a large number of freshly baked bagels. Would you like to come over to mine? I will ejaculate on one of those bagels and then force you to eat it. <laughs> that is disgusting. <laughs> I said to him, that is so gross, that is so awful. I can't believe you think I would just come over there and eat gluten. <laughs> Everything else I was fine with and did twice. <laughs> Um, so we, t we talked on one of the apps, and then we migrated to WhatsApp, and then we went on our first date, OK, very fun. We met in a little park. We met here in the meadows, OK? We sat by a tree. We had some gins in tins, and then we went to another bar for another drink. We went to another bar for another drink. We had several more drinks. One thing led to another. I don't want any judgment from anybody in this room, OK? We had ourselves a one-night stand. Woo! 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this show is that I own a PS5 and I'm an absolute shagger, OK? <laughs> I am a hot piece. Now, a one-night stand, it can be very awkward, can't it? Because you don't know if you're going to see the person again once they leave. Are they going to sleep over? Are they going to, like, leave in the morning without saying anything? Very tense. And if you do like them, you want to secure the second date, you never know how to. It's very awkward to start that chat. Lucky for me, David already had a plan in action, right? So, we wake up in my bed. And David goes, hey, listen, last night was great. Um, I'm really sorry, I've got to run to work. Um, I've just got a little favour to ask you, though, if it's OK. Um, I came to our date last night straight from work, so I've only got the clothes I was wearing to the office yesterday. And, like, if I go back in the same clothes, everyone's going to ask me questions like, oh, where have you been all night? And I just, I don't want to have an awkward conversation at work. So if it's OK with you, can I borrow a T-shirt from you? Um, and then, like, at some later point, I will give it back to you, like, over coffee or dinner or a show or like whatever you like um but or i can just like leave it back at the flat or whatever whatever's good with you and i went oh my god no of course yes you can you can borrow a t-shirt yeah, help yourself and I, I would i would love to see you again it would be really nice you, you you can keep the t-shirt as long as you want in fact and i thought oh how lovely we've just sort of like very naturally arranged this second day how fun little did i know david was being a right devious little slut there okay <laughs> organizing the second date like an absolute mastermind by asking me for that t-shirt and I gave him a T-shirt. I do feel slightly bad for him, though, because the whole point was so that he could wear something so nobody knew he'd been out all night or what he'd been up to. So I let him borrow a T-shirt, but the only one I had in my wardrobe was this one, which just so happens to say I just had full penetrative sex with Sam Lake. BSC ons. Um, <laughs> I like to add that last bit just to get my money's worth out of the computer science too, too, OK? <laughs> so... <laughs> so, at a later date, David gives me the T-shirt back and we start sort of, like, going out for a couple of weeks. Now, keep in mind, I was in Edinburgh at the time because I was here during the Fringe, so I wasn't here for long. So there came a point where I had to go back to London and David would stay here where he lived. And we sort of agreed, like, hey, if you're in London, uh, why don't you come stay with me? We can hang out. If I'm ever in Edinburgh, I'll, I'll come by and visit you. And, like, that, that would just be nice. We'll just see what happens. And what happened was a four-year-long, long-distance relationship, OK? I know, I know. And at the two-year anniversary point, something quite special happened, OK? Um, so, I'll, let me set the scene. Every anniversary, David and I, we're very cute, OK? We meet up at the very place that we had our first date, OK? At the tree in the meadows. He remembers the exact tree, right? We go there and we sort of reminisce in all of our memories. It's very nice. It's very fun. Now, for two reasons, anniversaries are very difficult for David. One, because I keep accidentally calling our anniversary David's Annual Review, which... <laughs> Someone told me good relationships are work, and I took that far too literally. <laughs> I get a HR department involved. It's quite awful. The other thing um, that is difficult for him is that um, we exchange gifts on our anniversary, give each other a little present. Um, and um, I would say I am a competitive gift giver. No matter what the situation is, I feel like I have to get the best gift possible, right? So if any of you ever got me in a secret Santa, congratulations, you're probably going to Disneyland, OK? That's how seriously, <laughs> that's how seriously I take it, right? There's only one time where I've not given someone the best gift that I could. It was at a secret Santa at work, um, and I got paired up with a straight person. I'm so sorry, I don't know what you like. And so <laughs> it was a straight guy. And so, like, I just sort of panicked. And at the last minute, just before we had to do the gift exchange, I went out and I bought, genuinely, I bought him as a present. I just bought him a hammer. <laughs> I was like, what do straight people like? Hammers, lovely. <laughs> And I wrapped it up, put a bow on it, and we got to the exchange. And I was like, oh, God, you're going to have to do that really cringe thing where you act like you don't know who got him for Secret Santa and pretend it wasn't you. And I'm watching him open the present, and he opens it, picks up the hammer, and goes, oh, my God, did somebody get me a hammer? And then he really excitedly just starts hitting things. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, how did I forget? Straight men love hitting things. Lovely. OK. <laughs> so even when I'm trying to give a bad gift, I'm giving a great gift, people. <laughs> 
and keep in mind, right, it's our second anniversary. So like this relationship's definitely going somewhere. So I feel like I've got to get him a really good gift, right? Now, I think I got him a lovely gift, right? What I did was I got him a digital photo frame from Argos, okay? Um, and I pre-filled it with lots of like fun photos of all the memories that we've shared together over our two years, like holidays we've been on, dinners out that we've been with friends, little parties we've been to. And I threw in some like tasteful nudes right at the end, just for him, just for a bit of him time, right? You've got to spice it up, right? And I preloaded it, wrapped it all up nicely. I got our friends like record little messages to send to us as well. Very cute. I was so ready, okay? So I head to the tree where we're supposed to meet up. I'm ready at the tree. David turns up. I give him my gift to him. And he's like, oh my God, this is such a lovely gift. He's like flicking through the photos going like, oh my God, so many happy memories, Sam. This is so thoughtful. I can't believe you went to all of this trouble. And oh my goodness, look at your naked body. It is so perfect and your penis is so huge. That's exactly what he said. You weren't there. You have to take my word for it, okay? <laughs> He loves the gift, right? And I'm like, it's not a competition, but if it was, <laughs> I believe I have won the anniversary, okay? Now, I would like to show you what David got me for our anniversary, okay? Can you see that? You guys over there might not be able to see. It's not really honestly worth seeing. It's, it's a little mug, little mug with my name on it in a, such a strange font that it looks like it says Jammy, not Sammy. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you have ever had to make that face where someone's giving you a piece of shit and you have to act like you don't <laughs> want to vomit at the sight of it. So he looks at me and goes, it's fuck because you, cause you sort of collect mugs everywhere you go. You like buy a mug, you like a souvenir mug. And I go, yeah, no, it's lovely. Oh my goodness, absolutely love it. I was just saying to myself this morning, oh, I'm so tired of drinking all of my liquids through a tube. Oh, <laughs> I am going to have such a dry lap now. Thank you, honey, it's so nice. And he sort of looked at me and went, um, it, it doesn't seem like you, you like the gift. It, it, in fact, it seems like you're actually quite angry about it. <laughs> and I went, honey, don't be silly, I'm not angry. I'm just furious, like... <laughs> I went to a lot of trouble for your gift, and this is what you get, just a mug. Just a mug, that's honestly all you get me, just a mug. Okay, thank you for making me feel very special indeed. And he went, okay, I thought you might react this way. <laughs> um, could you please very quickly look on the bottom of the mug? I know. <laughs> I mean, you guys know what this show is about. You know our relationship status. I'm sure you can guess what was on the bottom of the mug. I look on the bottom of the mug and it says, hashtag free Britney. Um, <laughs> okay, it didn't, but could you imagine? <laughs> I look on the bottom of the mug and it said, will you marry me? I know! God, he really pulled that round, didn't he? Uh, really did. And I was so happy. I was so excited. I ran around the whole of the meadow, just jumping and screaming, hugging strangers. At one point, I actually hugged a Mormon missionary <laughs> who post-hug said, oh, you seem like a nice man. Can I talk to you about the word of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ? And I said, oh, I just got engaged to a gay man. I'm also a gay man. We're going to be two men married to each other in a gay way. We're having a gay wedding. We're very gay. And he went, OK, not our key demographic. OK, you move on. That's fine. And there was me thinking that I would have the best reaction to finding out I'm getting married, OK? I loved... I, was, I thought I was going to be so... I, honestly, I thought I was going to be the most happiest person in the world. And I almost was. It turns out I was a close second. Um, I'm going to introduce to you a new character to this story. It is my best friend, Karen. Um, Karen's my closest friend, and she was the first person that I told that we were getting married. Um, what you need to know about Karen um, is that she has seen all of the stuff that you are about to see of her. She's fine with it. OK, I have her consent. In fact, her only feedback after seeing the show was, I like how much I'm in it. I should be in it more. Um, <laughs> so... So this was her idea. This was to prove how good a friend we are with each other, OK? To prove how close to friends we are. Here's a photo of me topless next to her actual biological mother. OK? <laughs> Is that doing it for anybody? 
No, I've also got this photo of me topless next to her actual biological father. There we go, just me and Adrian <laughs> bashing out some yard work, okay? Now, full disclosure, I appreciate this isn't like the funniest bit of the show, but you know what is funny? Because of those two photos of me topless in any health and safety risk assessment type of thing, I have to put a content warning that says extreme nudity. <laughs> extreme nudity. Those two little nips, extreme nudity. <laughs> Worth it, okay? Right, so you're about to see the video of Karen seeing the engagement mug for the first time. So strap in, all right? Can we play the video, please? Nice. Okay, yeah, can you just see? She's only just seen the mug there, already <laughs> emotional and tearing up. Okay? Just thought we'd pause it there so you can see the state that she's already in. At this point, she hasn't seen the bottom of the mug yet. <laughs> she has no idea what's coming, okay? So let's strap in and play the rest of the video, please. Oh. Isn't it nice? Isn't it nice? Do you like it? No, she deserves that. <laughs> we have to stop the video there because then she became incredibly violent. Um, <laughs> but, oh, that kind of reaction, oh, it just warms your heart, doesn't it? I was so happy that people were happy for us. I love telling people that we were getting married. I was so excited. It did backfire a couple of times, right? Um, there was a guy at work that I had told, he's the office gossip, right? He's called Roy, he's 59 years old. He keeps a spreadsheet with all of the gossip around the office. It's color coded, don't mess with Roy. Roy finds out from people around the office that I am getting married, okay? And so he comes up to me one day and he goes, Sam, congratulations are in order. I, Roy doesn't sound that camp, by the way. It's just, <laughs> it's just the only voice I have. He goes, congratulations are in order. You're getting married. That's wonderful. Tell me who's the lucky girl. And I sort of went, good one, Roy. And he sort of looked at me puzzled. And I went, oh, Roy, you haven't noticed like anything I ever say or do. OK. <laughs> um, the thing is, Roy, I'm not marrying... It to, I don't have to tell you, but I can tell you. I'm fine telling you. I don't have to... So the thing is, I'm not... It's not a... I'm, I, it's not... He's a... She's... I'm not marrying... She, she's... He's, she's a David. She's... He's a David. I... There's a David. I'm having a David wedding. <laughs> to which he said, Oh, right. Sorry, I understand. You're having a gay wedding. Right. A gay wedding. You're having a gay wedding. Yes, those are very trendy, aren't they? That's not the right thing to say, Roy. <laughs> trendy. That's how we describe my wedding. Trendy. Roy's that kind of person that I think we all have in our life who occasionally says the wrong thing but hopefully doesn't mean anything by it. Like, there was one time at work where I did a presentation that went really well. Like, every slide in the deck slapped. No skip, swear to God, right? <laughs> And to congratulate me on a job well done, Roy shook my hand. And as he's shaking my hand, he goes, Sam, can I just say, you've got very soft hands for a man. You've got very soft hands for a man. Is that a gay thing, Sam? <laughs> Do you have soft hands? And this is actually how Roy finished the sentence. Because your hands are always up a man's ass. <laughs> And I sort of had to go, no, Roy, no, that's not why I have soft hands. It is why I have soft elbows, but it's not why I have soft hands. But nonetheless, I still loved telling people that I was getting married. The only two people that it backfired on, one was Roy, and then one, coincidentally, happened to be that young gay man that I was talking about at the club, right? I was the only one on that night who would be willing to wait with him in the smoking area until somebody came to got him, right? And I'm a nice person, so I try and start a little conversation with him, and I go, uh, what can we talk about? Um, oh, oh, I've got some fun news to share. Um, I am getting married. Isn't that exciting? And he literally went, ew, old. <laughs> and I said, 
And I said, I'm sorry? And he was just like, literally nobody I know wants to get married these days. Why can't you just be Polly? Everyone's Polly, just be Polly. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I, I would like to get married. I just want to get married. Like, we, we love each other and we think it's the right thing for us. And we're, we're quite excited about it. And he was like, that's literally so pathetic. And I was like, pathetic? <laughs> Pathetic. That's how he described my wedding. Pathetic. <laughs> and listen, all of the lovely people who reacted so nicely, like Karen, who made me feel like I wanted to have a really lovely wedding day to celebrate all of the lovely people in my life, this kind of reaction made me want to throw the kind of wedding where I could really rub it in his stupid, dumb, cunt face, right? <laughs> I was now going to throw the biggest, bestest, go fuck yourself wedding that I could possibly put on. And when I tell you I got so far into planning this wedding, I had it all set up. I had the dream wedding planned, right? I booked this lovely venue in Glasgow, gorgeous, national trust kind of thing, lovely, big, open garden thing. We rented one of those, like, teepees with the fairy lights. It's quite tacky, but when you're getting married, it's sort of like, oh, it's our special day. And then, like... <laughs> And like, we had like one of those inflatable photo booths booked so like all of the people could like take photos. And you know, with the photo booth, there's like wacky costume items underneath and you reach in and like some of them are fun and then some of them are a bit inappropriate. Why is Aunt Claire wearing a Rasta hat? So that's not what we want. <laughs> the food we'd put, the best caterer to do was a traditional Scottish tasting menu, okay? All your Scottish classics, okay? Haggis, haggis neeps and tatties, haggis bonbons, <laughs> heroin carpaccio, <laughs> chocolate covered tramadol, all your Scottish <laughs> classics, okay? Oh my God, and the cake. Oh my God, the cake. I was so excited for the cake. I'd ordered a five tier cake. That's right, five tiers of weddingy cakey goodness, okay? Correct noise, that was, <laughs> do you need medical attention? Um, <laughs> A five-tier wedding cake, right? Big, big cake. So big, it's actually bigger than me and David. It was going to be on full view during the vows, OK? It was going to be me, David, and the cake right here. And there was a very good reason for that. Do any of you remember that time on the internet where you'd see a photo of something and it would look like the thing that it is? And then someone would come along with a knife, cut it in half, and show you on the inside it was cake the whole time. Well, that gave me quite the idea, <laughs> OK? So imagine, I'm here, David's there, the cake's there, right? And just as we're about to seal our vows with a little kiss, just before our lips touch, I was going to pull out a sword <laughs> and then cut David in half and reveal he was cake the whole time. <laughs> and actually, the cake over here was my husband in disguise. <laughs> Why would I do that to 170 of my closest friends and family who've all come to celebrate us? Because I'm only here to be a nasty little bitch, okay? <laughs> it is my right, it is my special day. I was so looking forward to doing the wedding exactly as I just described. Now, because of certain events over the last two or three years, we had to cancel all of that, right? We had to cancel all of it. We couldn't do any of that. It never seemed safe. We couldn't risk the health and safety of that many people. We waited for like the regulations to be opened up and it just never seemed to happen. So we eventually just gave up on ever having this wedding and we canceled the lot. And it was quite hard. Like, I'm, I don't want anyone to feel bad for me because this story has a very good ending. I want to assure you of that. But it was a very difficult time because it wasn't just that the wedding was gone now. It was also during that time, I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't do this, I couldn't do my day job, I was, I, it all disappeared and like all of you, you were just stuck in your house for ages, right? And I went to a very dark place, I did. I went to a very dark place and I'm not proud of it. I did some things whilst I was there that I am not proud of. Um, in particular, and I feel like I should publicly apologise for this, at a particularly low moment, I did start a podcast. And <laughs> I'm so sorry, please forgive me. If it helps, the podcast was genuinely called I've Had a Rosé, Let's Talk About Feelings. I was clearly <laughs> quite emotional. <laughs> now, <laughs> this is where I sort of knew that I had sort of got engaged to the right person because when he saw how sad I was, David came over and said, you've been very down lately, do you want to talk about it? Which is what I should have done. I should have just been honest about how I was feeling, but I sort of kept it all to myself. And I went, I'm fine, except... <sighs> 
I don't know, the wedding was sort of the last thing that I was sort of looking forward to in the middle of all of this. And now that I know that's not happening, I sort of, sort of don't feel like I have any purpose now. I don't know what to put all my energy into. And I feel like I've let uh, you and like all the people who are supposed to come to the wedding down. And like, I know that's silly, but it's just how I feel. And he went, look, I totally get it. But, and I love that you would plan that big extravagant wedding for you and for me and for that random gay man in the club that you need to explain <laughs> at some point. But you know I don't need any of that. Like, it's lovely you do that for me, but I would be quite happy with just, like, a quite normal wedding. Like, we could just go to the registry office and just do a wedding under whatever regulations are happening right now. Like, it doesn't matter to me. Like, everyone else can watch on Zoom. It doesn't matter. As long as you and me are there and we get married, that's all that matters. And I said to him, are you sure? Is that, are you sure that's what you want? Because yeah, we can do that. I'm happy to go to the registry office. I'll, I'll book it now. And he was like, yes. Do that. I love you, you love me, and that's all we need. We just need to do a wedding, and, and that's it. And, and I'll be happy, as long as I'm your husband. I said, oh, God, David, that's so nice. That's a really lovely thing for you to say. Could, could you not have said it before I booked, like, the five-tier wedding cake and the heroin <laughs> carpaccia? Chocolate-covered tramadol is very expensive. <laughs> But that's what we did, right? He said, let's get married in the registry office, so that's what we did, okay? And it was honestly the best day of my life. I wouldn't change a thing, except for like six or seven things that I would change, which I will now describe in quite a lot of detail, okay? <laughs> So we changed our wedding venue to Edinburgh City Chambers. It's not far from here, it's on the mile. Lovely, lovely place to get married, right? We booked it and we were all good to go. Now, we very last minute decided to hire a wedding photographer, but the mistake we made is hiring a wedding photographer without taking any look at their portfolio. We didn't know if they were already good at it. And I am very paranoid about having photos taken of me because I, believe it or not, do not tend to come out great in a lot of professionally taken photos, okay? And to prove this, I have brought my actual work profile photo. Let's all take a look at this, shall we? Can you, can you see this? Can you, can anyone, I know you're at a distance. Can anyone spot anything wrong with it? No? Could we, could we zoom in, please? <laughs> Who's that? Who's she? What's that looking at? The whole time the photograph was being taken, she was like, you're good at this, you should be a model. What a lying bitch she was. And keep in mind, I work with guys like Roy, who memed the shit out of this, right? There I am. <laughs> peering out a little letterbox. And then he added the caption, do you have any fish heads, please? <laughs> awful, awful stuff. Uh, so I was really worried that I wasn't going to look nice on my wedding day in my own wedding photos. Now, luckily, I think the wedding photographer did a very good job, OK? There we are. I know. This isn't actually during the ceremony, which is incredibly horny. Um, <laughs> now, we look great. We look lovely, OK? We look very, very nice. Um, but the thing the photographer got to do was make everyone else at the wedding look like shit. Because it's my special day, so I should look better than everyone else by comparison. And that very much did not happen. Um, please welcome back to the stage, Karen. Um, this is a photo, <laughs> right? We look great together. It almost looks like it's our wedding. <laughs> and not mine and David's. And I know people thought that, because I put this photo on Instagram, and a family member who'd not been in touch for a while messaged me and said, oh, I forgot you were getting married. Oh, many happy returns on your special day, and um, glad to see it was all just a phase. Just a phase. <laughs> he thought I'd packed it in and just married Karen, OK? It wasn't just me that this happened to. Uh, this is a photo of uh, my brother and my best friend Olga, right? They look great together, OK? The same family member messaged me and said, did you do a double wedding? Oh, congratulations to your brother as well. I was like, he's 18 years old, Gemma. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> this photo wasn't even on the itinerary. I am supposed to be in this photo. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> Don't know why this even happened, OK? So the photo's a bit of a mess, OK? Now, we got past it, and then the next thing, once the ceremony was over, you've got to feed everybody. Lost the caterer, couldn't get them back. So we had to find somewhere that could accommodate the 15 people that we had at the wedding. Um, and we found this gorgeous little artisanal restaurant. I don't know if any of you have ever been. It's called Pizza Hut. Um, <laughs> there we are. 
having a lovely time at Pizza Hut. Um, you might be asking yourself, Sam, lovely photo, but can't help notice your husband is not sat at the table with you. Well, due to COVID restrictions at the time and no more than six people to a table, they decided to sit my now husband at the back of the restaurant. <laughs> look thrilled about that. <laughs> um, one other thing, uh, the guests that I got to the wedding, very small, we could only have 15 people, right? So it was very exclusive. If you get an invite to this wedding, you're a tier friend, right? And I asked my friend Chloe, Chloe, I'd love to have you at the wedding, it would mean the world to me. And she said to me, oh, I would love to come, Sam, um, but I don't know if you know this, your wedding day is the same day as the England versus Ukraine match during the World Cup or the Euros or the Tiddlywink Championship, whatever the fuck it was that you were watching. <laughs> So she said, I will come to the wedding, but I will bring a laptop so that I can watch the match during your wedding day. And I said, that's a very funny joke, Chloe. Anyway, here's Chloe watching the football during my wedding day. <laughs> and you better believe these three were screaming in the middle of Scotland, it's coming home! <laughs> they did not realize they were not currently at home, okay? <laughs> But that was sort of the end of the craziness on the day, mostly. And I was quite glad for that. Because, like, did you ever hear those, like, sort of, like, religious people who used to say, if gay people were allowed to get married, then, like, crazy shit would happen. Like, I don't know, like, there'd be extreme weather events or things like that. There'd be, like, there'd be hurricanes, typhoons, flash flooding, right? It, crazy stuff that they would say. I was just thinking to myself, God, that w what, wouldn't that be weird if that did happen on my wedding day? <laughs> my house flooded on my wedding day. <laughs> and I kid you not, my husband and I looked at each other and went, I think this is our fault. <laughs> I think we have powers we didn't know about. How awful. But it was all fine, nothing was too bad about it, okay? That was the end of the craziness on the day, apart from one last thing. And we're pretty much at the end of the show now. Thank you so much for watching, laughing. You've been a lovely audience. This is the last thing that went wrong on my wedding day. It's 10 a.m. on my wedding day. We're all up in my flat, me, David, my brother, and Karen. We're all getting ready in our flat, right? And we're getting ready. I'd hired two cars to take us to my wedding ceremony, okay? Two nice cars, right? First car turns up, and I say to the other three people in the flat, you guys get this one. I think I need a bit more time to get ready um, because I don't know if you know this, if you're putting on two jock straps every day, <laughs> they do often get tangled. <laughs> so they get in the first car, I wait for the second. I'm outside, I'm in my tux, I look lovely, I'm ready to go, but the second car on my wedding day never turns up. Never turns up on my wedding day, okay? On my wedding day, and I'm in an immediate state of panic because I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? And then I think to myself, okay, the, the ceremony's not that far away. I think I can make it if I run. <laughs> That's right, I run to my own wedding ceremony. Very Julia Roberts of me, isn't it? Very <laughs> Julia Roberts. Oh, what a field day my Fitbit is having. Oh, the step count, okay? I start belting it to Edinburgh City Chambers, okay? I am running faster than I've ever run in my entire life. I am at top speed, and I am so close to Edinburgh City Chambers. I pass through the columns, I'm in the courtyard. I can see people from my wedding party go into the building. I can be like, oh God, okay, I'm here, I've made it, I'm on time, amazing. But because I'm still running so quickly and I'm not looking where I'm going, I accidentally, keyword, in my haste, push over an old lady on my way into Edinburgh City Chambers. I push her right to the ground, okay? It is bad, all right? I push her right over. And I'm a nice person, so I stop to check that she's okay, by which I mean there were enough people who saw what had just happened that I felt like I couldn't just keep running and hope I got away with it. And I look at her and I go, I'm so sorry, you're not gonna believe this, but I'm getting married, like literally in seconds. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I hope you're okay. Do I need to get you help? I'm literally getting married in there right now. I'm so sorry, I really don't know what to do. And she looked up at me and went, oh my God, right, okay, don't worry, I'm, I'm fine, I'm sure I'm fine. Ow, ow, I'm sure I'm fine, ow, I'm, I'm fine. Don't worry about it, you go in, you get married. And I hear her go out and I'm like, okay, you're obviously not okay. Um, do you want me to get some help or something? Um, you seem like you're in pain, does it hurt anywhere? And that was the wrong question to ask this lady. Where does it hurt? Because then she responded, oh, just a couple places, I'd say, my neck, my back. <laughs> <laughs> my 
We're all singing the song in our heads. <laughs> Liam, do you know the song? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, but no. Do you know the lyrics? Yeah. So if I say, my neck, my back, you would say... My pussy, my Oh, we're thinking of two different songs. <laughs> oh. Never heard that one. God, how embarrassing for you, specifically. <laughs> I'm just kidding, dear. My neck, my back, let my pussy and my crack. The song of the summer, I think we can all agree. <laughs> and it triggered a wave of nostalgia in my head that was inescapable, even though I was in a very much a crisis situation. She's there on the ground, and in my head I'm going, my pussy and my crack. <laughs> And she's, like, waiting for a response, because I'd just been doing this quietly to myself for about <laughs> ten full minutes. And she was like, are you OK? Could you say something so I know you're all right? And I sort of looked at her and I went, well, I can't say pussy and crack to an old lady. That'd be so inappropriate, but it was the only thing in my head. In up here, it was just pussy and crack, 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 pussy and crack. Sam, do not say pussy and crack to an old lady. She wouldn't like, don't say pussy and crack. Do not say pussy and crack. You can't say pussy and crack. Don't say crack, but definitely don't say pussy. Do not say pussy. Do not say the word pussy. You cannot say the word pussy. Do not say the word pussy. Why are you only thinking of the word pussy? The only word in your head is pussy. Sam, one, two, three, say a word that's not pussy. One, two, three, pussy. No, Sam, that was the word pussy again. <laughs> say any word that's not pussy. And I look at her and she's really boring right into my eyes. So I look at her, I muster all of my strength and I go, poo. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Minge really loudly. I screamed minge right in an old lady's face outside Edinburgh City Chambers just before I was supposed to get married. Screamed it right in her face so loudly that my husband-to-be heard it from inside the building, came outside to find out what was going on and was horrified and went, Honey, we're supposed to be getting married right now. Why are you screaming minge at an old lady who's quite obviously just had a fall of some kind? <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, honey, you don't understand. I pushed her. <laughs> oh, dear. And then we got married and it was lovely. Um, <laughs> now, sometimes I tell people the story of my wedding day and they go, Wow, okay, that's an entertaining story. There's no way all of that crazy stuff happened to you on your wedding day. That is unbelievable. Like, all of those things on the same day. Maybe one of them, I believe it, but all of them together at the same time, no, I'm not buying it. Some people see this show and they go, there's no way that story is true. And I do not know how to convince these people that this is actually what happened on my wedding day. There's no way that I can convince them that it's a true story, which it is. What can I say um, apart from... Babes, I can't help it if my life is dramatic, <laughs> yeah? Monkey Barrel, you've been an incredible audience. Thank you so much. This has been great. All you ladies pop, yo, pussy like this. Shake your body, don't stop, don't miss. All you ladies pop, yo, pussy like this. Shake your body, don't stop, don't miss. Just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it now. Lick it good, suck this pussy just like you should. Right now, lick it good. Suck this pussy just like you should My neck, my back Lick my pussy and my crack